Good evening. How many of you are excited about being here tonight? We're, we're going to have a lot of fun, and uh, you're going to be blessed. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of different issues and uh, some things that are very, very important that are going on in the world today. I do want to uh, announce we have the sheriff of uh, Villa Nueva here. I want you to stand. Turn around. Turn around. Oh, my. Give him some love. Come on, give him some love. You do not want his job. I've seen a couple of rhinoceroses in the tours over in Africa or wherever they exist, and your skin is as thick as a rhinoceros, brother. But um, I, I heard that you were in the house tonight, and I just wanted to uh, give you the honor that is due you, and thank you for serving this city and these people here the way you serve. Let me introduce our participants tonight. First, I want to introduce to Jack Hibbs, who's the senior pastor of Calvary Chapel in Chino Hills. And uh, he started a little Bible study in his house with six people over 30 years ago. And uh, that little Bible study has grown to over 10,000 people on his campus that he leads, and millions of people around the world through media and technology. And uh, he's a dynamic Bible teacher. Uh, one of the things I love most about him in recent years is he has truly been on the front lines against some of the culture wars that we are facing today as normal people. Amen. He is... Um, you can follow him at jackhibbs.com, and uh, he's heard uh, on a daily, weekly broadcast at KKLA. Uh, Terry Fahey, uh, again, uh, thank you for hosting us tonight. But his program, I'm actually preaching this very moment on KKLA at 7 o'clock. But we plan this event so at 9 o'clock when you're on the way home, you can listen to Jack Hibbs all the way home. I believe that God saved some of his best pastors and preachers for this current generation, one of which is Jack Hibbs. I want you to put your hands together and welcome Jack Hibbs as he comes to this platform. Jack, come on up here, brother. He's already here. Oh, my. Come on, give him some love. Let's go, let's go, let's go. We put him in the far left chair because he's the most left-leaning of the three of us. <laughs> that was a joke. Our next participant, uh, Dennis, don't come up here till I'm finished my spill here, man. Dennis Prager, nationally syndicated talk show host, heard across this country in some 400 radio affiliates. His home station is AM 870. He's heard every weekday from 9 o'clock in the morning to 12 o'clock noon. Jack's sermons are less than an hour. His are three hours every single day. He's the founder of Prager University, the most conservative video site in the world. They have one billion billion views per year, and most of those are people 35 years and under. You can follow him at DennisPrager.com or PragerU.org, and the rumor is that Dennis even talks in his sleep. Will you please put your hands together and welcome Dennis Prager to this stage?
Oh, we're just getting this party started, amen. I want to thank you both for being here. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a joy to have you here, and thank this great audience. Thank yourself for being here. Look at this great audience here tonight. I know that you've both been friends for a long time, but uh, I felt like the very first question, because we're going to ask questions about the Jewish faith and the Christian faith, and you're going to hear two different sides of, of, of many different topics tonight, but I just felt like the first question needed to be about the people of Ukraine. I just felt like we needed to start there because of what's going on in our world. And my question to both of you, you can both uh, respond, is just what is your heart and prayer for the people of Ukraine? And what do you think the United States should be doing about that situation over there? That's, that's my opening question for you both. Okay. Uh, I'm glad you raised it because it's the elephant in the room. So uh, I want you to know it's rare that an event preoccupies me as much as this one. I've lived through a lot of tough stuff, been broadcasting for 40 years, but this is really, really bad. This is evil. And I totally understand that we cannot involve ourselves with troops. Having said that, I, I, I need to tell you that I feel, and I, I choose words very carefully, I feel like I am a powerful man on a street and I'm watching a woman get raped and I'm not doing a damn thing. That's how I feel. I could actually cry, to be honest. Most powerful country in the world can't do anything. It's a bad, a bad way for the world to be. All of my life, when nations got raped, they prayed that America would come to their aid. This is a new moment in, in modern history that America isn't. Economic sanctions are not the same thing as fighting. At the very least, we should have been supplying with them with every possible armament, every javelin that knocks out a tank, every anti-aircraft ballistic missile that we have, and we have them all. They begged for the weapon, I think it's called the harpoon, that takes out ships. They never got them. Why don't they have at least great weapons? And the reason we can't send in people is because we really don't know that this man would not start using nuclear weapons. I don't know if he's normal. The reports are to the intelligence agencies that during COVID he was so isolated and so scared, he would have the fecal matter of anyone who visited him medically examined before they could meet with him. That's his top generals and anyone else who visited him. He's apparently sent his wife and children to a, a, an impregnable bunker in Siberia. He's put his forces on nuclear alert. It may all be a bluff, but it may not be. I was a child during the Cuban Missile Crisis, but I distinctly remember not being afraid whatsoever. I didn't think that Khrushchev would go make a nuclear war over Cuba. So it, it, I, life was normal. It's not normal today. It's not a normal Russia. It's ironic that the Hebrew word for evil man is Russia. It is, that's exactly the word. How ironic. There's a Russia running Russia. So it's a very sad moment. And I think we will pay a price in our self-image. We do have a self-image of the rescuers of people from evil. It's a wonderful self-image to have. And to a very large extent, it's true. When they, when they 
marched for freedom in Hong Kong, they marched with an American flag. I don't want those days to be in the past. So those are some words from uh, my heart to yours about uh, Ukraine. Jack? Yeah. Thank you, Dennis. The situation is one where I have always been proud to know that when any nation, we were famous as a nation, as a benevolent nation, that when any country called upon us to defend their freedoms, we would boast that we could be there to help them within 24 hours anywhere in the world. And you can get into a debate all you want between the Russian and the Ukrainian dynamics and all of this and that and who's in charge of what. But the fact of the matter is there are people that were wanting to be left alone and be their own country. And that was unacceptable to Vladimir Putin because he has delusions of grandeur regarding restoring the Soviet empire. Just by the way, as Erdogan has to restore the Ottoman Empire. We've got the world right now with some very scary people in power. They've been there for a long time, but we didn't know it as much. And this is not a political statement, so please don't take it this way. When President Trump left the scene, it left a huge void in the world's leadership. Putin didn't do those things for four years because he didn't know what Trump would do. And with Trump out of the scene and no one else on the scene, you've got guys like Putin and like Xi Jinping and others who are now going to be testing the resolve of the free world. A lot of people are saying, but Ukraine's not a NATO partner. I think that's a cop-out. We're talking about the United States here. And we can deal with this. Dennis said that we're sitting this out. You know, you know, we have the power, physical power, to do something about it, but we don't have the will to do something about it. And I'm concerned about that. Just know this. Every guy in the room knows this, by the way. We learned this in our maybe by the first grade. And that is, when, you, when there's a bully in your class or on the playground... That bully will exploit every single one of you until, frankly, somebody stops him. And, I, and here's what I'm saying, is we learned early on in the school district I grew up that you'd, you'd find the bully. And the best, even, even if the bully could beat you up, just walk up to him and you'd punch the bully in the nose. And he'd probably beat you up, but the rest of the year was fine. <laughs> because he would never do that again. And what's happening is no one's stopping Putin. The weird thing to me is that they should have taken the Ukraine in about two hours. Something's weird going on. And I think Sue just told us before coming out here, I don't know if this is true or not, I have no reason to doubt her, but she said that she had just heard that the Russians have, had bombed a nuclear power plant in Ukraine. You don't go around bombing nuclear power plants unless you're crazy. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm concerned that we're in a situation right now that the Ukraine is a springboard. And if you think I'm making it up, go talk to your Polish friends or your Romanian friends or your friends in Estonia or Latvia because they're very nervous and they're on alert because Russia has ratcheted up to a nuclear level. So this is, this is the elephant in the room. We don't know what's gonna happen next, but it is possible that if China messes around with Taiwan, it's clear we will do nothing. And if Russia continues to advance, we will do nothing. And if Iran sees this happening, Iran will fulfill its dream to destroy Israel and eradicate every Jew in the nation of Israel, which has been their longtime dream. For those of us who know our Bibles, by the way, you're recognizing immediately Ezekiel chapter 38, the possibilities of what could be. So that was a happy beginning. <laughs> <laughs> It'll but, get but, better. but necessary. It'll get better. 
So what, what I think we'll do is we're, we're going to pray, but we're going to wait to the end of this program, and then we will pray before we dismiss for the people of Ukraine. Does that sound like a good deal to everybody here today? So I, I'm thankful again that, that you two agreed to be here. I couldn't think of two greater people to be here. And uh, Dennis Prager, uh, he's kind of a rock star. Amen. Amen. And uh, Jack Hibbs, uh, I've got people that live right across the street from this church that commute all the way out to see you every weekend. <laughs> I, I don't take it personal, but um, <laughs> my question for both of you, uh, because I, you know, I, I, know, I know both of you, but, but uh, when, you, when you get up in the morning today, tomorrow, the day after, you eat breakfast, and you walk out your front door of your house. Is there any divine, do you feel as though there's any divine purpose for your life? When you walk out that door, is there any call of God that you feel up upon you, that God has placed upon you as you walk out that door? And if so, what is that call? What is the call of God upon your life right now? as you walk out that door? That's my question. Jack, you want to go first? Absolutely, yes, 100%. I mean this with all of my heart. For those of you who have heard me say this before, I literally ask God to fill me with his Holy Spirit before my feet get out of my bed. I get my feet right over the ed edge of my bed, and I say, Lord, fill me with your spirit today that I'd walk in your power, and Lord, that I might just cause others to just get a little, little closer to Jesus, a little closer to knowing the love of God. So use me today, interrupt my schedule today any way you wish. And so here I come and I put my feet on the ground. And from that moment f further, I do not look back. I just go forward every day. That, is, that may sound religiously active to you. For me, it's so meaningful and purposeful because the book of Isaiah tells us that our God knows. Our God knows. He's the God that has written the things of the future down in ancient times. And I'm a big fan of him knowing the future. He knows the now. And he's the eternal one. And he told Moses in the burning bush, I am, you go tell the children of Israel, I am that I am sent you. The eternal one that's self-contained. I trust him every day. If, if he can lead them through the wilderness and if he, he can keep Jupiter moving and the moon doing what it does, then he's got my life. And he's never let me down once, not once ever. Well, you asked me the $64,000 question of my life. So I recognize more and more over the course of my life that I'm not normal. Thank you. He said, he said we thank God for that. I, 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 I'm glad you feel that way. So here's an example. When I was a junior in high school, I kept a diary. I still have the diary and I wrote I know exactly what I do, what I want to do with my life. I want to influence people to the good. To write that as a junior in high school is not normal. <laughs> and I have not deviated a day from that in my life. My older son, when he was about 21, said to me something that made me aware of how abnormal it was, and it was important that he told me this said, Dad, you have no idea how lucky you are that you knew so early what you wanted to do with your life. Most people don't. And he was right. And he was speaking for himself, for that matter. He's blossomed into a spectacular young man. But most people don't know at 21. Many don't know at 61. And I knew at 16, and I haven't deviated. I have always felt, and I, 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 I can say this to a religious audience, because so, you'll, you'll know what I mean. I have always seen myself as a vehicle. I'm not an end. 
I'm a vehicle. And it has given me such staggering peace. So if God wants to use me, it'll continue. And if he doesn't want to use me, it won't continue. So I've never asked how successful am I. I just know what I have to do. I want to make one more point, though, about me and God. We have a respectful relationship, (laughs) more than a loving one, which to many of you is, is not heretical, but perhaps strange. Uh, I have only asked God once in my life for something. By the way, I got it. So it was sort of like, I'll show you, Dennis, (laughs) you arrogant skeptic. (laughs) But literally one time in my life, my life is overwhelmingly what does God want from me rather than what do I want from God. I think it's a beautiful way to live a life for many, many reasons, which I won't get into, but that is how I lead my life. And I think I'm clear about what he wants me to do. So, yes, I walk out of my house every day with a sense of mission. A guy asked me this week, uh, uh, who was asked me this? Was it somebody at the station or someone on the radio? Dennis, you're broadcasting 40 years. Do you still love it? And I'm thinking, first of all, why wouldn't I? How many people get to talk to millions of people about what they think every day? I mean, are you, you, you got to be joking. Uh, would I not lo- when, did I, when would I stop loving it in year 31? I, I don't understand. But aside from that, that's not the issue. I have a mission. So the, isn't, is the question, Jonah ran away from his mission. I embraced it. This is my mission. And it gives me spectacular energy. And, and, and when I'm, I'm with 1,800 people like you, all it does is reinforce I may be doing something right. And that's a wonderful thing. Dennis, I would... That's beautiful. I would add with your batting average at prayer... Oh, that yes. You should, that you should ask more I am. often. You're right. <laughs> I'm afraid I'll get disappointed. <laughs> I, I fully acknowledge... <laughs> This is true. It's childish of me what I just said, but I, I'm being totally open. I, I, I don't want to push my luck. <laughs> I'm one for one and retiring. <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts running through my head, but I, I'm just supposed to moderate. So we're going to ask, I have some Bible questions for you gentlemen, but I have one more question just about what's going on in our world, specifically our city, Los Angeles, and our state, uh, California. And uh, recently in church, there have been so many people who've moved to Texas and they've moved to Tennessee and Idaho. And uh, it's like the great exodus out of California right now. And I, just a couple weeks ago in church, I, I said, raise of hand, how many of you in church, you, you, you have thought, you have thought about moving out of the state of California? And it, it looked like every hand in the church went up, it, like everybody's thinking about it. And my question for you, both of you, when I look at our city, uh, the, 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 the problem with homelessness, I look at our open borders, I look at the drug uh, crime uh, statistics, Everything that just seems to be, the seams are just falling apart is how I look at things, how I see things. My question to you, how much much of the distress in this city is due to left-leaning politicians and decisions they have made versus how much of it is due to a true spiritual void in people's lives, that they simply, these people spiritually are just lost, and it's the result of not knowing God and Jack and I, not not knowing Jesus Christ. So that's my question. Both of you. 
This is very near and dear to my heart, and I appreciate you asking this. I didn't know you were going to ask this question. You don't know any of these Wait, questions. you mean you knew the other one? <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah, it was the other one I was ready for. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Dennis and I both approached... This is my answer. It's going to go this way. Dennis and I both pr approached together Larry Elder to run for governor, as an example. Okay? Why? So why? So we sat down with Larry, and we spent a lot of time together, and we crafted what was going to be done about the homelessness and all of that. And I don't know why. I lead this into the sovereign hands of God. But what Larry had come to the conclusion was is that this homelessness issue and this stuff, it's so big, it's, like a, it's, a, it's an elephant. And so, Jack, what do you think about this idea? We talked about this at his, in his living room. He said, what if, what if you could reach out to the churches in California and if you could communicate to every pastor in their town where they're at that the state of California, if need be, w would help a church to reach out to the local homeless that's nearest to them and that there's people in those churches that have businesses and some mode of getting them on their feet that the mentally ill, then they would be defined. These over here are the mentally ill and the state's to take care of them. But to those who need a hand up, Jack, have the churches in California do that. Will you do that for me? I said, yes, sir, I'll do that for you. So to answer your question is, the problems that we have in the state is from bad leadership. It doesn't, listen, it doesn't have to be that way. According to the scriptures, in Proverbs 29, it says that when the righteous are in power, that doesn't mean you glow in the dark and you have a halo and you eat Bible verses in the morning. It says when the righteous are in power, it simply means those who do the right thing, when they're in power, the people live in peace. But when the wicked are in power, the people groan. California's been groaning for so long, and it's because the Republican and Democrat parties have failed us in this state. Let's be honest. What I believe the only cure for California, by the way, I'm not moving. I already went through that gymnastics years ago. I'm not moving. I'm not in heaven. I'm going to go to heaven when I die. I'm not looking for heaven here on earth. But California is worth fighting for. And my passion is this. We need to elect the right people. We need to vet them. That's what we do. We find the right people. We get them and encourage them to run for office. And then, frankly, we get people who care to get their money where their mouth is and get good people elected. But the bottom line is, you cannot look at California and tell me it's not worth fighting for. This state led the way, and you name the topic. And if we didn't lead the way, we invented it. This is the greatest state. It's so pathetic, we're at the bottom of the heap. Why? Because one party rule has driven this state into the ground. Number two, and I'm done, the church has been absent. The church has got it back in the streets, and the government should, out, should not have to worry about the homeless situation. We need to love on people. The church, every church in California must mobilize and reach the person that's nearest to them. And you would see this thing get fixed in six months. I guarantee you, because God's people can do it. Every church, every synagogue empowered just with a thumbs up. Can you imagine if a governor said, do it in your town, go. It would be amazing. Our governor's not going to say that. Newsom's not going to say that. But we, you know, look, you guys, God bless you. Did you know the recall effort was the largest recall effort in American history? There's no, there's no way the guy should be in office still, but he is. But it woke up a sleeping giant. Just wait. So I'd like to uh, take a crack at that. You, the question you posed, if I recall, is the issue the left or the spiritual void of many people in the society, and I would argue that they are almost one and the same. The uh, leftism cre has created the spiritual void, and it has filled it with false gods and nonsense. Uh, Chesterton, you'll get a kick out of this. So, uh, I'll, I'll, before the Chesterton quote, it reminds me, I do something that I 
I regard as very precious in my life. My two grandchildren live in Florida. So we do a Zoom, I do a Zoom with the older one almost every week. And I, for, for many weeks, we just did Bible verses and stories. And in the last few weeks, I decided I want to teach him quotations because if he memorizes them, they will serve him great in his life. The more you memorize as a child, the better. We don't have that anymore. But memorization, or every, every line I memorized has served me tremendously. So for example, I taught him one from Dostoevsky, a famous one from Brothers Karamazov, where there is no God, all is permitted. So I, I explained why that is so true and it made an impact. Then I did the Chesterton line, which is what bring, that whole preface was to this. So it is attributed to Chesterton. It hasn't been established conclusively that he said it, but he probably did. Chesterton was a, a real wit. About 1899, 1900s, and the quote is, when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing. They believe in anything. That is the summary of our time. So people don't believe in God and the Bible. That's nonsense. And Christianity is nonsense. So what do they believe? Men give birth. <laughs> that is a, the best possible example of Chesterton's quote. They don't believe in nothing after they stop believing in God. They believe in anything. They really believe men give birth. They don't just say it. They believe it. Men menstruate. It's fair to women when men com biological men compete against them in sports. That's fair. You have to have a sick mind, a twisted soul to believe that that's true. I, mean, I don't care if you're an atheist or a believer. It's, it's bizarre to believe that. So this spiritual void and leftism are one and the same. This group, I suspect, is a group of non-spiritually void people. Uh, it's not a leap of faith on my part. I, 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 I think it's a fair assumption. And I suspect there are very few leftists here. There may be some liberals, but that's, that's fine. That's, a, that's not the issue. My issue is with the left. That is, the, that is the creation of the, the void that has been created in our society. So they are very related, the two things you, you, you mentioned. I would add this, that Paul, uh, Saul of Tarsus, or Paul, uh, a Jew, right, in the New Testament, wrote that in the last days, there'd be these false doctrines that would permeate the world. We relegate, we think false doctrine, that's a bad teaching, that's a bad doctrine in a church setting, like a false prophet. Well, it certainly includes that. But when you look around at exactly what Dennis just said, bad science, insane conclusions, ill logic. The Bible says, Paul told Timothy, these are doctrines of demons. So when Dennis and I talk about spiritual entities or issues manifesting themselves in a physical world, that shouldn't surprise any one of us. Read the Old and New Testament. It's all there. So when people have agendas, what's driving them? If they have a biblically-based worldview, then it's going to dictate how they decide things. I personally have a vetting code that I've invented. I was, I'm kind of, I, I shouldn't say I invented it. It works, which means God gave it to me because I don't think I've ever had an original thought that's worth anything. But it was good enough for Ted Cruz to pick up when, on his campaign when he was running for president. And that is there's three things that you can look at someone regarding their voting record and find out their convictions and their position. Are they leftist, progressive, conservative, right? What's the deal? What is their view on the definition of marriage? What is their view on the sanctity of life? And what is their view on Israel's right to exist? 
I called it the trinity of truth. Those three things, you can, I can tell you from a candidate or anybody else in this room, where you land on those three things, I can tell you exactly where you're going to be on, on defense spending, on budget, on, the, on social issues. It's remarkable. So what you believe matters. And when you have people like we have today running around in America in charge who have no moral rudder because they have no fear of God in their minds, the Bible says, then every man will do what is right in their own eyes. It's quite remarkable. So I cannot separate. I don't believe that there's a sacred and a secular. I believe it is all sacred. A lot of things have been polluted. But that's where we're to shine the light. That's where we're to be involved. So, yeah. So, be, let's give him a hand there. Be, before I ask the next question to them, I want to ask in the audience, how many of you are here uh, and you, you, know, you heard about the event, but you are, you are a Jewish person, you practice the Jewish, either you're a Jewish person or you practice the Jewish faith. I want you to raise your hand real high, raise it high and wave it like this so we can see it. Okay. And then how many of you are, how many of you are of the, of the Christian faith? Raise your hand. Okay. Is that kind of what you expected, Dennis? So, yeah, but I thought you were going to ask Protestant and Catholic actually. I did ask this question in church uh, two weekends ago. How many of you come from a Catholic background? You come from a Catholic background. Yeah, a lot of people. So here's my question to the two of you, since we have people here that are Jewish and, 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 and Christian. Dennis, if someone comes up and said, just say, hey, what is your faith? How do you answer that question? Just what is your faith? And then the same thing to you, Jack. Jewish. You just, that's all you say? Well, that's all they asked. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, uh, Do they ever ask you what I, kind of a Jew? I, oh, no, that's fine. If they ask a second question, I have more to say. <laughs> that's great. Uh, uh, <laughs> was that like a Jewish answer? Was that uh, <laughs> a Jewish answer would have been, what do you mean? <laughs> Jews answer with questions. But I, if, I do have other faith, questions. What's my faith? Actually, well, well, I mean, the, if you want to go that further, you practice, the faith that you practice, I, I, I am a practicing Jew. Uh, I am non-denominational. I believe the Torah is from God, the first five books of the Bible. I, uh, uh, I am uh, my, if you want to go further, uh, and this is re re relevant to me, not necessarily to anybody else, my vehicle to God is reason. It's part of the reason that I have been able to bring many people to Christianity and many people to Judaism. When I was in, uh, my wife was with me in uh, the Czech Republic this last year when I spoke in Hungary and the Czech Republic. I was at a dinner with about 20 young people and it was very moving. Guy came over to me, guy living in Prague. And thanks, thanks to Prager Hughes Reach. And he said, I just want you to know Ben Shapiro brought me to conservatism, and you brought me to God. Wow. Wow. And he's, a, he's a, a faithful Christian. And I looked at him, and they were all listening, and I said, I can't tell you how happy and proud I am. All I ask from you is tell everybody it was two Jews who did that. It's true, the first time I met Dennis, I said, you're my favorite Jew, and he goes, that's not true. I'm your second favorite Jew. <laughs> right? It's true. <laughs> so, I assume you're gonna ask me the same question. My question, I believe, is uh, the, right question, the, the right answer, the answer I'm gonna give you is, listen, I just sounded Jewish for a second. Um, I believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, listen, this might shock some of you. I have no idea. I would have no idea if the New Testament's true unless I've read the Old Testament. You got to understand that. Everything that, the, everything that Moses and the prophets said and wrote about is in the Old Testament. 
okay? But what Christians do in the West is they don't read the Old Testament, they read the New. So my question to you is, how do you know it's true? You'll never know it's true unless you read the Jewish scriptures. Because listen, when the first century church met and Paul told the Corinthians in Greece about the gospel, that Christ was to come and die as our, as our sacrificial lamb and be resurrected. Paul said that to the Corinthians, and he said, I teach you this based upon the scriptures. What scriptures was he referring to? Old Testament. There was no New Testament then. So for me, I'm a Gentile that's been grafted in to what is known as the commonwealth of Israel. Isn't that what the scriptures say? The scriptures say that we who are Gentiles have come to faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's why personally, I'm, I would need the sheriff's protection for this. If somebody were to come to me and say, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in Israel or the, I don't believe in the Jews, I'd have to have the sheriff hold me back <laughs> because I don't know what book you're reading. So I have the privilege, Dudley and I have the honor and the privilege to be grafted into the promises of the Hebrew scriptures. And, and so I'm a, I would say in this day and age, and I'm done, I'm a follower of Yeshua. I believe that Jesus is Messiah. I'm the follower of what I believe the Hebrew scriptures teach of the Messiah coming. You may disagree with that, that's fine. But I have to tell you, we're not far apart. Do you understand that? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You need to go find out who that well, God is. Well, we're not only not far apart, but I mean, I say this with the joy of knowing you and many like you here and you, but I say this with sadness as well. That, in fact, in terms of what matters to me more than anything, values, I'm much closer to you than to most Jews. Uh, and, I mean, and by the way, most of you are closer to me than to most non-Jews. It just, it's a, so, I, I'm so aware of this, and it's been so long in my life, uh, I, I was blessed by God or faith, I never know which, because how can I say for sure? My first professional job, well, no, my first radio job in my 30s was Religion on the Line. Some of you will remember the program. Um, um, yes, it, it was, awesome. I was asked to be the moderator of a Sunday night show which was the most, became, it was, and then even further, the most popular radio show in LA on Sunday nights. If you have 3% of listeners, you are usually the number one show in your city. That show had 40% of LA listeners on a Sunday night. People, you have no idea how many women came over to me, which I, I actually liked. Dennis, <laughs> just, I was a single guy, and they came over, and they go, you know, I just want you to know, I, I go to bed with you every Friday night, every Sunday night. <laughs> it's like I'll never forget. I, have, I get a lot of these. These, are, these comments keep me young, I have to say. <laughs> a woman calls my show a, about a year ago, and she goes, I just want you to know, I, uh, I have breakfast uh, with uh, Hugh Hewitt, and I shower with you. I thought that was a beautiful comment, frankly. I... <laughs> anyway, I was blessed to moderate this program. I came from a very hermetically sealed Orthodox Jewish background in Brooklyn, New York. I not only never met Christians, I, I never met non-Orthodox Jews. <laughs> oh. It was really, it was hermetically sealed. My wife who was here has heard this many times, so I always feel a little twinge of guilt but you haven't, <laughs> so it's fine. I, I'm into my nature was built an ache to know the other, mm. ache. I would actually try to time knowing when the mailman came to interview him. <laughs> he, I knew he wasn't Jewish. 
So I just wanted to talk to him. What are you like, sir? Do you have a family? I mean, whatever it might be. My father in the, I'm old enough to remember radios you know, where you actually dialed the station. You turned a dial. For those of you young here, that's what we do. We turn dials. So to get to what he wanted, he would pass, you know, 10 stations. And whenever he passed an evangelical preacher, I'd go, Dad, stop. And he goes, they, Dennis, that's, that's a Christian preacher. I go, I know. I want to hear it. And, and that, those are the moments when my father didn't, wasn't sure if I was adopted. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 he didn't know where I came from. So, but I remember I was so interested in Christians. And so here I am, my first radio job, a priest, minister, rabbi every week, different ones each week. And this is what happened. Number one, after, it was 10 years, August 82 to August 92, exactly 10 years. And I remember by year four, I thought, I'm f I, I, I could choke up. I'm falling in love with these Christians. That's how I felt with both the pastors and the priests. I just, I really adored them. They were such sweet people in, in almost every case. And then I came to another realization. The biggest differences every single week were not between the Jews and the Christians. It was between the liberals and the conservatives. A liberal rabbi agreed with everything the liberal priest and liberal minister had to say, and the conservative rabbi believed, agreed with everything the conservative priest and the conservative minister had to say. Yet they didn't agree on Jesus, and that was it. But every other issue in life, they, that was the dividing line. And it's been true my whole life. That's amazing. I'm going to ask a question. <laughs> okay, so, so th 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 that was, was that great or was that great? Come on, come on. Wait, wait, wait. Which are you clapping for? Great number one or both, great number both. two? Both, both. Okay, this, this is good stuff. So here, here's the question. It's written down here. I wrote it down in ink. This is not just, this is all God ordained here. The Old Testament, which you both, both, both of you believe in the Old Testament. There's 39 books in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament paints a prophetic picture of a coming Messiah. You both believe that the Old Testament paints this picture of, it's prophetic, that someday out yonder the Messiah is going to arrive. And of course, Christians believe, Dennis, believe, uh, uh, Jack believes that Jesus was the one who fulfilled all of those Old Testament prophecies in those 39 books. And Dennis does, to my knowledge, does not believe that Jesus fits the prophetic word from the Old Testament that Jesus is, is not who that Old Testament is, is painting as the Messiah. So my question to both of you, one is to Dennis, different questions, same topic. Dennis, why do, you, why do you not believe that Jesus is a fulfillment of those prophecies that were painted? And Jack, why do you believe that Jesus is the fulfillment of those Old Testament prophecies? I had a feeling that would be asked tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let, me, let me, there are many answers. So I try to narrow it down to a few that hopefully you will ap appreciate if, if, if whether you, I'm obviously not agree with necessarily, but this will may come as a surprise to you. The dividing line between Judaism and Christianity theologically is not with regard to whether Jesus was the Messiah. It's whether Jesus was God. Jews would have, there would never have been a, a division of a new creation called Christianity. It simply would have been Jews for Jesus, uh, which is a, a group that exists in America, for example. If the only difference was who's the Messiah, everyone who believed that Jesus was the Messiah would have stayed a Jew. The Jews would have accepted them as Jews. 
Jews don't disqualify people on the basis of their belief on who's the Messiah. Jews have believed any number of Jews. Bar Kokhba was uh, in, in the revolt against the, the, uh, the Romans. He, he was regarded uh, as a Messiah unknown to most Jews, let alone non-Jews. Half the Jewish people believed in 1666 that a Turkish Jew named Shabtai Tzvi was the Messiah. None of them were uh, regarded as not being Jews. Uh, there, there have been a handful of co contemporary living Jews today who believe the, this, this great man, the, the, the Chabad rabbi, Rabbi Schneerson, was the Messiah. Most, most Chabad Jews do not hold that, but some do. They're not re re read out of the Jewish faith. The issue is the Trinity and, and, and Jesus' uh, being regarded as, as God or Son of God. That was the dividing line. So the messianic issue is, is not the fundamental dividing line between the faiths. Number two, the, there's a different role that the Messiah plays in Christian theology than Jewish theology. The, the Jewish Messiah is not a savior. It, it's just a, a figure that God will send, and, and it's really debated in, in, in Jewish life what will happen? Will that usher in the afterlife? Will it usher in just a wonderful world here? We don't have as worked out as Christians do uh, the issue of what the Messiah is or will be or who it will be. We pray for the Messiah. It's one of the 13 principles of the Jewish faith that the Messiah will come and bail this miserable world out of its misery. That is, that is a hope. Uh, but uh, it, it, it's just not as central a... Uh, I, I went to yeshiva. I'm interrupting my own sentence, which I hate doing. It's, it's I like, do that a lot to I'm myself. sorry? I do that to me. Yeah, no, no, I know we all do it, but I, I really hate when I do it to myself. It's, it's unprofessional. Uh, but anyway, uh, I went to yeshiva, which is Orthodox Jewish school, very intense, till I was 18 and uh, continued after 18 even. Uh, half the day is in Hebrew, Jewish studies, and half the day is in English, secular studies. You go from nine to five. I mean, it, it, it was rigorous, but I, I, I learned a great deal. And you will be stunned to know, I would say that in all, let's see, 12 years, uh, the Messiah was probably not discussed for more than 10 minutes. This, and it is a wow that is very appropriate for you to make because the, the messianic issue plays a much greater role in, in Christian life than in Jewish life. Jewish life is, is devoted, religious Jewish life, to pretty much the question that I asked earlier, what does God want me to do? You, if you really love God, it says in Deuteronomy, you will, you will observe his commandments. That's it. That, that's, that's, it sounds prosaic even, but I, I have to tell you, I think, I, think, I think Jesus was right actually, that in, in some ways they, the Jews went too far with the law. So I'll just end with this, which is a challenge to both faiths, and the reason I feel so comfortable in making it is I love both groups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I have no, no compunction about saying this. In life, our blessings are often our biggest challenges. If a woman is very beautiful, it's a blessing, but it can be a real burden as well, or, or any, any, any gift that one may have. So the blessing of Christianity is faith. The blessing of Judaism is law. But it's easy to go too far with either of them. Jews did go too far on the law issue. Uh, I, 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 it's why I'm not completely orthodox. I'm observant, but not as observant as orthodox Jews are. And, and I do believe that, look, there's a great rabbi, you wouldn't know of him, but his name was Menachem Mendel of Kotsk in, in, I think, 18th century. He said, sometimes Jewish law is idol worship. Mm. It's a very powerful line. This guy was an ultra-orthodox rabbi who said that. And I would say to Christians, sometimes faith can be idol worship. 
when the only thing that matters is faith and not behavior, when the only thing that matters is law and not how good you are, this is what the prophet said, I'm sick of your sacrifices, be decent people. So, and, and, and what did James say? Yes. Without, your, your faith is nothing without works. Those are the messages that are most critical, in my opinion, to both groups. We have an immense amount to learn from each other. My God, if you only learned the Sabbath from us, you would have an infinitely richer Christian life. The Sabbath has died in most Christians' lives. It's a tragedy. By the way, I have a question for you two, interestingly, and then please answer this. And, and because I will, I, I will not tell you what I, in my mind, predict, because I've asked this of Christian clergy, I did for 10 years on Religion on the Line, are Christians obligated to the, fifth, uh, the fourth commandment to, to keep the Sabbath? Yes, Guinness? Yes. The book of Colossians says yes, but it's fulfilled in Christ, it says, that he is the fulfillment of the Sabbath, that our Sabbath is in him every day. Paul said some men choose to Sabbath on this day, some on the other day, but he said, I esteem every day alike now in Christ, for he is my Sabbath. Right? What's your, what's your response? Uh, same as his. But wait, I, I get to answer the... I get to answer the original, the original question. No, I, wanna, right? I want... Yes. <clears throat> okay, the original question. Moses said to the children of Israel... God will raise up to you a prophet in the future, him you shall listen to. Interesting statement. God gave Moses the law in Mount Sinai, and he gave him many other instructions, right? And we read it. What's interesting is nowhere in the scripture regarding the law does God say, I'm going to save my people by the law. In fact, he said, the day that you break my law, you're going to need what? You're going to need a sacrifice. You're going to need an innocent lamb. And where does that pattern come from? Even before they got to Mount Sinai, we've got the death angel, the, the rec rescue out of Egypt. What was, and I, I don't, I'd love, some, we need to sit down someday and talk about what I'm about to say because it's, who knows if it's right or not, but... When you read Exodus, the requirement for the death angel to pass over, was it that you were Jew? Did Moses say you got to be a Jew for the angel to pass over? What was the issue? Blood. Innocent blood. What kind of blood? Lamb's blood. So for me, the reason why I believe that Jesus is the Messiah, Dennis is waiting for the Messiah to come. I believe he came and that he's coming again. Here's the reason why is because, first of all, a uh, little bit of correction on, on Dudley, what you had said. Jesus did not fulfill all of the Old Testament prophecies. Not yet. He fulfilled 300. He's coming back to fulfill the others. It's very clear. So, remember that. By the way, all of the 300 that he fulfilled, all of them had to do with the Old Testament regarding God's sacrifice for sin. So, for example, Zechariah 9.9, Hebrew prophet, told Israel, watch out, keep your eyes open. The day the Messiah comes, you'll be able to recognize him. He'll be humble. He'll be riding on the back of a donkey, a colt, that no one has, no one has ever ridden upon. You know what we call that? We call it Palm Sunday. Isaiah said that Israel's Messiah would be born of a virgin. That's Isaiah 7.14. The one that would be born of a virgin, it says in Isaiah 9, 6, that he would be called the Almighty God and that the governments of the world would rest upon his shoulders. Why does it say that? Because in the beginning, Elohim, I am, plural, God. That's why we believe in a trinity as Christians. So when the people of Israel shouted 2,000 years ago on April 6, 32 AD, Jesus is riding on the back of a donkey and Jerusalem's going crazy. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The 
the people thought that this is the Messiah that's going to deliver us from everything. They, the scriptures tell us that they failed to recognize that he came first to deliver us from our sins. That he's coming back someday, not as a suffering savior. I, we believe in Isaiah chapter 53 that the Messiah suffers before he comes back to reign. And then bottom line is this. That King David said in Psalm 22, a thousand years before Christ was born in Bethlehem, that they will look upon me whom they have pierced, and I've been, I will be encircled by Gentiles who, op who will open up their mouths and wag their tongue at me as a curse. It's remarkable. Micah chapter 5 verse 2 says that the Messiah would be born in a town called Bethlehem, for out of Bethlehem Epaphrathah shall he come forth unto me, whose goings forth have been from of old, even eternal. And then here's my final one, because I have 59 just like that. But this is my favorite. Solomon said in Proverbs, Who has ascended into heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has bound up the waters in his garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? If you can tell me. That's Proverbs 30, ladies and Proverbs 30. I told you earlier, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah, not because of the New Testament. The New Testament records the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises. That's how I know in whom I believe. And so, for me, my faith is not in faith. That's kind of a stupid conclusion if your faith is in faith. When you go down to LAX and you get on a plane, trust me, you better not have faith in faith. You better have faith in the God of science who created aerodynamics so that big piece of metal gets off the ground, right? Think about it. You can say, I have faith, I have faith, I have faith. You're only as safe as the object in which you place your faith in. And for me, it's Yeshua, it's Jesus as Messiah because of the prophesied scriptures. So I, I would like to add something, and that is that I regard, and this, I'm not speaking on behalf of all Jews, I'm just speaking on my own behalf, but I regard Christianity as a divine way of bringing the world to Sinai. So I see you, all of you here, well, nearly all of you, and the two wonderful pastors between whom I'm sitting, as divinely ordained in your Christianity. I don't see you as a false religion. Uh, I would, if I did, I would respectfully say, I don't believe that there's truth to it, but I'm happy you have it. I don't, I believe that it is a divine way of bringing the Gentile to Sinai and the world to Sinai. The greatest Jewish philosopher who ever lived, Maimonides, in the 11th century, uh, who was uh, no fan of either Christians or Muslims, he was persecuted by both, yet he wrote at the end of his great work on Jewish law, the Yad HaChazaka, means the strong hand, and he wrote that it's Christians overwhelmingly who have brought the Torah to the world, more than Jews have. And for that, I thank you, and how could I not believe that that is a divine calling, since that's what I want. I want the world to know the Torah, and you're making it possible. You guys, I, I hope you caught the gravity of what Dennis just said. That's massive. Truly massive statement to say. And again, I humbly, on behalf of all the Gentiles in this room, Dennis, you may or may not know this, but the New Testament teaches in the book of Romans, Paul, the Jew, 
writes to a bunch of Italians and he reminds them that it's because of the Jews who have been the ones who have been the custodian of the scriptures that God gave them that you Romans, that the world can know salvation because of the Jewish care for the scriptures. Remember, your Bible, your New, your New Testament says that. I appreciate the compliment he gave us a moment ago, but we've got to be very specific. God appointed the Jews, and he has chosen the Jews, and they have been the protectors of the scriptures. The Bible says so. And, and I, want, I want to just say on behalf of whoever's listening, or I don't know if this is ever going to be rebroadcast, but it is. we need to remember something. We need to remember something. There is a reason why. Look, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but I don't go around whining about how much the Portuguese have been persecuted in life. I'm Portuguese. I don't go around. People shouldn't go around whining about how much they've been persecuted because of this. I don't care what color you are. You shouldn't go around whining about it. If you want to compare persecution to persecution, there's no one that comes close to the satanic attack that has been against the Jewish people as soon as Satan figured out that the Messiah would come from Israel. And it, Satan hates the Jew. And if you're in that realm of thinking, you need to get out of that realm of thinking. The greatest friend and ally on this planet to the Jewish people should be the Christian. And if you're not, something's wrong with your theology. I love you, but something's wrong with your theology. And so I'm going to need a car waiting for me immediately after this is over. Just had to get that off your chest, didn't you? I did. I just, I had to. Dennis, do you, do you feel loved by Christian people? The ratio of love from Christians to me vis-a-vis -vis Jews is a thousand to one. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> it, it's a painful truth. Uh, a lot of Jews can't stand me because I'm, I'm, I'm the most well-known conservative Jew. And uh, the, I don't know how, I don't know, it's an interesting question. I don't think about it much because I've never been preoccupied. But you feel it. I'm sorry? You feel it. Oh, I'm going to come to the Christian part in a moment, but I, I'm, I'm dealing with the Jewish part. <laughs> the, but uh, it's, it is important that you know this. Uh, the love that I receive from people like you is very touching to me, but I have never sought to be loved. And you can't be a leader if you seek to be loved. I would betray you if I did. Awesome. So I, I need you to know, I need you to understand that. Also, I have a motto that I developed early in life. I, I don't let compliments go to my head, and I don't let insults go to my heart. Everybody should adopt that motto. So as a general rule, Christians love me more than Jews, and the reason is that most Jews don't share my, my social and political views, and I'm, I'm very public, and I'm out there, not just out there, but out there as a Jew. So uh, I went from the, the, the second most frequently booked lecturer in Jewish life in my 30s and 40s to almost never booked. <laughs> <laughs> Only Elie Wiesel got more bookings than I did at the time. And that was because Jews drifted left and I drifted right. I mean, I, the truth is I have the same values I did when I was a Democrat but they left my values, I didn't leave theirs, in my opinion. As regards Christians, um, it, it is a sort of love affair, and it touches my heart, uh, and I'm very moved by it. It's not something I would have predicted in yeshiva. <laughs> Dennis, you will really be 
a big hero among America's Christians. I, I didn't see that in the cards when I, when I was studying Talmud all day in Aramaic. Uh, just life, it's like Yogi Berra's great line, when there's a fork in the road, take it. So this was my fork in the road. So it's interesting. My dream is that, that eventually more and more Jews will read my Torah commentary. There are 4,000 reviews on my Bible commentary, nearly all are from Christians, many of whom that brought the, the, my, my commentaries brought to, to them to faith in God, which makes my day. I love that. But the Jews are a difficult people. God knew that. By the way, I want to tell you something. I, I want to say something on behalf of the Jews, now that I've <laughs> said all these other things. Uh, first of all, if, uh, <coughs> excuse me, if Jews were not so stubborn and difficult, they never would have survived. I mean, I, I take that as a given. And number two, Jews are annoying, but they don't murder anybody. <laughs> and, and that's a very important little uh, uh, extension. And we appreciate that. Yeah, yes, that's right. Yeah, I'm glad you, that's right. So, you know, a perspective is, is, is important here. Also, one final thing. One of the reasons, one of the biggest reasons I believe the Torah is divine is because the Jews are depicted so negatively. There is no holy work on earth that depicts its group as negatively as the Hebrew Bible uh, portrays Hebrews. That people don't make up a crappy past. So it must be divine. And I, and I mean that, that is one of my biggest arguments for the authenticity of, of the book. And the, the heroes of the Torah, which the Torah is primus inter pares, first among equals for Jews. Jews believe in the, in the inspiration of the rest of the Bible, but the, the, the divine origins of the Torah, the five books of Moses, that's always been a given to religious Jews, and it is to me. And in those five books, there are more non-Jewish heroes than Jewish heroes. Very few people think about that, but, the, but there are. Noah was a non-Jewish hero. The daughter of Pharaoh is a non-Jewish hero. She saves Moses. The daughter of Pharaoh. Uh, Jethro is a non-Jewish hero. The, he's a Midianite priest, and without him, Moses couldn't even lead. I mean, the, these are the, the Shifra and Pua, the, the Egyptian midwives who don't listen to Pharaoh. Uh, I am convinced they're Egyptian. Some people think they were Hebrews, but... The, it's overwhelmingly, uh, I, I, I show in my commentary on Exodus why it's overwhelmingly likely that they were, uh, that they were Egyptian. And, uh, and look at the Jews. I mean, how, you know, Moses is a hero, of course. Uh, Aaron, his brother Aaron, is a very problematic soul. He helps, them, he helps the Jews build the golden calf. What kind of leader is that? And, and, and loses his two sons. Nadav and Avihu, I guess Nadab and Abihu in English. Uh, and and uh, it, it's, just, it's just endless. Joseph is a hero, that's true. But the brothers are not heroes, right? Although Judah comes out very nice by the end, I have to say. He does. It's a very, very powerful story. Judah, Judah is one of the great metamorphosis stories in the Bible. And I, I love, see, you know this. It's so nice. <laughs> you know what's beautiful about what he's saying is, I mean, get your mind going, right? What about, think about Ruth. Uh, what, about, what about Rahab? Oh, well, that's my favorite. I have to say, you hit, I was just talking Torah. <coughs> She's in Joshua, so I want you to know, I just want to say this, this may not go over well here, I acknowledge this. God could have chosen any Canaanite to let the Jews into Canaan. A Canaanite poet, a, a Canaanite accountant. Plumber. He chose a Canaanite 
prostitute. I'm a God fan. That, that goes to show you how loving and awesome the God, listen, Christian, there is not a God of the Old Testament that's different than the God of the New. That redemptive story, man, think about it. Whatever you've done in life, God forgave and blessed Rahab. Right. If he can do that to Rahab, he can do that to you. He can give you a brand new life. That's what he does. And by the way, all right, so I'm going to say something that I don't know how, I don't think everybody will agree with, but it'll, it, it, it's thought-provoking for your interest. I think that there's a lesson in that he chose a prostitute. There are a lot of lessons. I think there's a lesson in the fact that Tamar... Judah's daughter-in-law acted as a prostitute and she is the mother of the Messiah. Yep. Your Messiah and my Messiah. Now, why would that be? And, or what, at least, what conclusion might we draw from that? I think that in, 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 all, in all the monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, I think there has been too much emphasis on sexual sin as the premier sin. That's my theory, and I think God wanted to make that claim by doing that. There are a lot worse people than prostitutes. I want to add one more. This is a tricky one. It's just fun. I just have to get it out. It's why you're here. <laughs> so who was the first Jew? Abraham. What was he before he was a Jew? <laughs> Where did he live? See this? Habakkuk, the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 4 says, the just shall live by faith. God told Abraham that he was justified by faith before Moses was born, before Abraham was circumcised, God had already declared 14 years later, you're justified by faith. Isn't that wild? The first Jew, by the way, is this true? That Jew, Judah, Jude, means to praise or a praiser, worshiper? It's interesting. I don't know. I, I, I don't know, and I know biblical Hebrew really well. I never thought of what. The, I thought of it solely that his name was Yehuda. Which, and that came to mean Jew, uh, but I don't know if it has a root. I'll have to. It, it may Let well. No, tell us on the radio tomorrow. We'll All right, that's it. a deal. I will. So, what time? What time? What time, time will you talk about this? Tune in. Tune in, everybody. Tune in. All right, yeah. the whole three hours. So I just think it's awesome. There's hope for everybody. God calls Abram out of the Ur of the Chaldees, which was a pagan worshiping region of the world. And God reveals himself to him. And I love, it says in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews 11.8, this has been a motto of my life. Ab Abraham went out following God, not knowing where he was going. That's faith. He kept his eyes on the Lord. I mean, he kept his eyes on the Lord a few times. He got off and felt, you know, they went down and... And God said, what are you doing here? And he had to get back on course. But doesn't that happen in life? I'm so grateful that he's a redemptive God. And he's merciful. And when you read David, don't you listen, you guys. Do you read David? When you listen to him, you want to be like David. You say, Jack, he committed adultery and he killed the man's, he killed the woman's husband. And I get that. But he also cut off a giant's head. And he was an amazing man of God. Isn't he a picture of a life that is redeemed? David wasn't perfect. He says, I was conceived in iniquity. But David also said, one thing have I desired in my life, and that, that I will live after. That's my pursuit. And that is this, that I might live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I don't know about you, but man, that is, that's what I want. 
By the way, I would like, I would like to add your speaking about David and, and, and the immense sins that he committed, not only adultery, but getting arranging for Bathsheba's husband Uriah to, to be killed in war. And yet he is the great leader, uh, the greatest leader uh, in, the, in the Old Testament uh, outside of Moses. And that is the reason that I believe religious people have far more wisdom than secular people as a rule. There are always exceptions. There are religious fools, and there are some secular wise people, but as a rule, and it, it came to fore with Donald Trump. Religious people were not preoccupied. Religious people who, who ironically are very strict on sexual sin were not preoccupied with Donald Trump's sexual sins. Secular people were. We asked what God asked. Are you going to be a great leader, not are you a sinner? God in the Bible talks about Nebuchadnezzar and says he's my servant. Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon. You look at Donald Trump, come on, at the start. Look, the guy's, his tweets back then, he doesn't tweet like he used to. A lot of people miss that, but, <laughs> uh, but his hair, you know, look. Forget all that stuff, but did you know this? I'm going to tell you something you guys don't know. And the reason why you don't know is because it hasn't been said. Uh, you might appreciate this. Trump gets elected. He's in the cabinet. And a friend of mine, a very dear friend of mine, is inside that room. Donald Trump goes through the business of the day. And he says, is that it? Anything else? No, sir. No, Mr. President. That's it. And he goes, well, there's one more thing. We have failed to bring up the issue of relocating the embassy from Tel Aviv to, to Jerusalem. Listen, listen. Around the room. Uh, sir, uh, uh, sir, um, the only guy that said you should do it was Ben Carson. Listen. Sad to say, I'm a son of, of a Marine Corps family. It's pretty sad, though, that the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they were in the room, and the Marine General said, Mr. President, with all due respect, I do not have enough Marines on the planet to prevent World War III from happening, should you do that? He's, President Trump said, I didn't ask you if we were going to do it. No, this is true. Yeah, I'm giving it straight to you. President Trump said, I'm telling you we're going to do it because number one, watch this, this is Donald Trump. Number one, I campaigned on it. Number two, the capital of Israel is Jerusalem, and everybody knows it. And he said, since June of something, under Bill Clinton, it became a law. Did you know that? It was a law that the president was supposed to relocate, and, and, and Clinton punted on it, and so did every president, including our dear... Uh, Listen, <laughs> Trump said, bottom line, we're going to do it because it's the right thing to do. And this is fun. He asked, he said, we are the United States. Don't tell me we do not own land in Israel. I want to see it. We're not leaving this meeting until I see the land we own in Israel. Guess what happened? They waited. Some guys come in with blueprints and all kinds of stuff. They unveil it, put it on the table. I'm getting this from firsthand experience. They laid it out on the table. Trump said, what is that huge piece of land? That's, that's David Friedman's, where, where the uh, ambassador lives. He goes, that's too big. <laughs> Have you been there? Have you been to the embassy? Yep. Yep. Listen. So he said, uh, I, I want the embassy there. And they said, sir, it's going to take $100 million, and it's going to probably take about three to four years. Trump said, May 14th is Israel's birthday. 
You have $100,000 to change out the carpets, paint the walls, get Friedman out, and he can sleep somewhere else. This is the embassy. That's what happened. Dennis, did you know that story? Do I know that story? Yeah, did you know that story? Well, not that specifically, but I knew how much opposition there was. My wife and I were invited to dinner with then Vice President Pence and his wife and his daughter. It was just us, another couple, and Eric Metaxas, who many of you know. By the way, I opened up the evening looking at Vice President Pence, I don't think has uh, laughed at a joke in 11 years. <laughs> and uh, I, I said, Mr. Vice President, I'm really, my wife and I are truly honored to be here at your residence and have dinner with you. I just don't understand why you invited Eric Metaxas. <laughs> and Metaxas and I have a unique relationship of constant insulting of one another. Anyway, he didn't find it funny at all. Uh, I, I did. I often say things that I find funny because I love laughing. If I'm the only one in the room, okay, c'est la vie. But so at that dinner, uh, uh, the vice president said to us, it was really dramatic. He was on the phone with virtually every major world leader telling him, do not move the embassy. Every major world leader telling the vice president, please communicate this to, to, to your president. He can't do it. There's gonna, the, the Arab world will blow up. The Muslim world will blow up. 53 countries are Muslim. You can't do this. The State Department, the same exact thing. You can't do this. Like they told Truman, you can't recognize Israel in 1948 in the State Department, the same State Department. And Trump just went his merry old way. It's a very important lesson. And, okay. and by the way, you know what happened? Isn't it funny that the moment that the embassy was relocated, did you, know, what, did you watch nations of the world relocate their embassies too? It happened. Why wasn't it reported? It actually happened. What happens when somebody leads? People will follow. In both That's directions, why you want good, good and bad. That's right, good or bad. All right, we have just a few minutes because uh, we need to pray uh, before we leave, and I want to get you out of here at 845. Uh, I have s some popcorn questions. You know what that means, right? No. It means that you can only give me one-word answers. This, oh, this can't be another that, uh, long. That's not fair. Th right. This is hard for you. I did that one already when you okay, said, what's your I, faith I, Jewish? I, I just have I a gave couple. You, that was it. I fulfilled my quota. You can do it. You can do it. It's just a quick question, just a quick answer. How many times have you traveled to Israel? About 25. Jack? 21. 21. Have you ever thought about running for public office? A lot. Never. If you ran, what office would it be? Vice president. You want to know why? Yes. I have one mission in life, to influence people. Mm. I have no interest in power. I only have interest in influence. Amen. And a vice president has no power, but has incredible influence. If I went to Oxford, a thousand students would show up. If I went to Bulgaria, 10,000 people would come to a stadium. I want to talk to as many people as possible before I die. I can't believe that the internet has made it possible. But that's all I want to do. I, 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 am, I am in love with the founders of this country. I believe they were prophets. I really do. I never has a co have coalesced so many great God-centered men at one time in one place. And, and they, that's what they wanted. They knew. They knew, as Lord Acton put it, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. They, they made a system where there could be as little power concentrated in any one arena as possible. We're not a democracy, we're a republic. Right. 
we were not founded to be a democracy. The founders knew that if you let the, the majority rule, you will end up with tyranny. We have seen that now. That is what the left is about. That's why they're crazed in their hatred of the, of the electoral college. Is that a long answer to yes, that's, that's, yeah. uh, that's a topic for tomorrow's radio show. I'd like to revise my answer, though. Uh, if Dennis is vice president, then I would be president. Okay, okay. All right. Woo! I thought I'd let you know. I love it. All right, uh, a couple more real quick ones. Yes or, just yes or no, will Trump run in 2024? Will he run? Yes or no? Uh, you, are, you, okay. <laughs> the, you're putting me on the spot because I also need to answer, do I want him to? No, that's not the question. Just will he run? Yes or no? Probably. Jack? Probably. Will Republicans, will Republicans have a landslide victory in the midterms? Yes or no? Uh, between now and November is so long so much could change that I, I respectfully do not answer the question on prediction. All right. I just want to answer that a little further. <laughs> I am very clear about my life and what people should do. I am working toward their victory. I do not predict it. I... I believe that Republicans will win. I don't know if it will be a majority because I predict rhinos will lose. The rhinos will be flushed out. They're going to lose. So how many office seats are held by rhinos? We're going to be finding out. So I don't know if they're going to win, but it's possible. Depends on how many rhinos are in the camp. Two more. What do you love about KKLA and KRLA? What, what do I watch? What do you love about, about them? Oh, I have a good answer for that. Let me hear it. Popcorn. I do. I, I will tell you. Uh, this is a very important question to me. <laughs> oh, 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 I, I, I usually know why I'm funny. Why was I funny on that one? <laughs> that it's an important question? Because we're running out of time. Are you running out of time? It's worth it. <laughs> Listen. This is a, I have a very serious answer to that question. When I interview conservatives who live in Europe, European conservatives, at the end of the interview, I almost always have said for years, you know what the big difference between your country and my country is? And they go, what? We have talk radio and you don't. And every one of them says that's exactly right. Talk radio has been the backbone of conservatism in the United States of America. I've worked, I've worked with Salem since 1999. I adore them. And I adore them because they're in it. They want to make a profit, and I hope they make millions of dollars, but they're in it for the idealism. I worked for ABC for 20 years before K KRLA and, and Salem. They were in it for the money. Disney was in it for the money. That's why I left them. They had no interest in values. The smuttier the, the, the talk, the better they liked it because they thought they would get more people. So I, I have seen both worlds. That's why, by the way, I always tell people at speeches for any of my stations around the country, please support their sponsors because they're the people who make talk radio possible. That's exactly right. Jackson? I love what Dennis said a moment ago. Did you catch the word? Profit. I want KKLA, I want Salem Broadcasting to profit. You say, well, how does that work? Well, they charge ministries like us to be on. What's wrong with that? Nothing, it's perfect. God's people in worship invest in the ministry that they're involved in here. Some of that is taken and it costs money to be on the radio. Let me ask you, listen, follow, follow this through. Follow the prophet. In this world, nobody works for a poor person. What happens is they make a profit because they're doing a good work. That's a biblical concept. Secondly, what they provide is the opportunity for us 
to preach the gospel to millions of people every day. So listen to this. From, from worship in the pews, through the ministry, to KKLA, Salem Broadcasting, out to the recipient that's driving in traffic or sitting at home, salvations are made. And you want to talk about a prophet? That's the prophet. How much money will you spend to bring one soul into eternity? Think about it. Some economies roll in certain areas. Isn't it amazing that Jesus said you will choose to either worship God or money? I think that's amazing. When the children of the kingdom can take money and use it to advance his word, that's what changes world. That's what change. That's what we need in America. We don't need, the answer is not in the White House and it's not in the State House. The answer is in God's house because if the truth is told, people's lives are affected, which is why there are people in Congress who want to pass laws to shut KKLA up and to shut Salem down because those that are in that family are hate speech propagandists. Why? Because we don't sing their songs and we don't promote their mantra of social justice or isms. We preach the gospel. Dennis speaks truth. And that's worth investing in. I'm grateful to Salem. We work with them for years. Going to keep doing it. All right. Let's all stand and let's thank our guests here today, Dennis Prager and Jack Hibbs. Let's thank the Lord for them. Rabbi, thank you for singing for us tonight. I want to thank Terry Fahey and uh, Salem Broadcast and KKLA and all the people that work there. And I just think we need to bow our heads and, and have a word of prayer. And I want to thank you for being here tonight. And again, at 9 o'clock, Jack Hibbs will be on the radio. You can listen to him on the way home. And uh, again, just uh, there was an insert there that we gave you as you walked in that has information about uh, both of them and the ministry, uh, Radio KKLA and our church. And we invite you to take that with you. But uh, again, you've been, you've been a gracious and uh, a, a warm and wonderful audience tonight. Hopefully we can do this again sometime. But let's bow our heads and just take just a moment to pray as, as we leave. God, we thank you for tonight. We are, we are a better people for being here tonight and hearing what we've heard. And um, the more these two men spoke, the more I fell in love with them. Just their heart and their intellect and their their love uh, for people, and their love to do the right thing. I thank you for the, 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 the biblical, intellectual, faith-based discussion that we were able to have about the Messiah. And Lord, I pray for anyone who's here that in their heart, they just have even more questions. I just want to encourage them to, to follow up with those feelings, with those questions. The great thing about today's world is you can find anything and, and study it on the internet. You can, you can pick up a Bible, you can read the Old Testament, you can read the New Testament, and you can discover this for yourself. Who is Jesus? And who is the Messiah? And is he the Son of God? And I, I pray that tonight's discussion uh, from both sides of that fence will encourage us to sharpen our faith and to sharpen our intellect into doing further study and further research. God, thank you for loving us. I, I, I think Dennis said something, and I, I didn't quite catch it, but I, I do hope that everyone in here knows that God is a God of love, and he is a God who loves each of us individually. He created us. He knit us together when we were in our mother's womb. He knew our names before our parents gave us our names. Uh, he, even, he actually, the, the Bible talks about he, he knew us before we were even conceived, which is a, a whole other level of his ability and his knowledge and his omni, omni, om, 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 omniscience that he knows how many hairs we have or don't have on our head. And he, 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 he controls and he raises up kingdoms and, and, and kings and 
And Lord, we know that there's a lot of things going on in this world, and right now all of our hearts are focused on what's going on in Ukraine. This very moment while we're in here having a dialogue, there are bombs being dropped on people, and, and I believe unlawfully. And I, I, I pray, Father, that you would touch somehow, uh, because I can't talk to Putin directly, but the Holy Spirit of God would somehow intervene in that situation and change the course of history and direction of what's happening there. I do believe that there's all kinds of levels of truth that what is happening there can spread throughout the rest of Europe and maybe around the world if it isn't stopped. And so we, we, we might have waited too long to get involved with World War II, and I pray that we don't wait too long to get involved in this situation. Be with those who are making the most difficult decisions. Help them, give them wisdom. Father, I thank you again for tonight and just each of us. Protect every man, woman, boy, and girl. Watch over us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your provision. And thank you for tonight. We pray this in your son's name. And all God's people said amen and amen. God bless you and thank you for coming tonight.